Okay, well, um, we are going to record this simply because there were a number of people who expressed a desire to be here who couldn't make it, so we'll find a way to post this. And you got one of these good. Um, so my name is Mark Dombeck, um, and what I want to talk to everyone about tonight is basically the sort of mechanics of getting yourself and your website noticed online and separately. Once you get someone to notice you, how to use the website to basically convince them to call you versus somebody else because as we all know, this is a very crowded market. And any place that you might be practicing, um, this is likely going to be the case, at least in this part of the world. Um, maybe a very brief introduction to who I am and how I came by this particular knowledge, which is a little bit less typical uh, for this group. Uh, I am a clinical psychologist. I did all the standard stuff. I came out of the UCSD SDSU joint doc program in 1995. Uh, ended up doing a postdoc at uh, the Yale Psychiatric Institute. <coughs> Was a professor for a few years. But in the late 90s, right before the, well, about a, about two years before the first internet crash, <coughs> um, I ended up working for a company that did basically software for community mental health services. And I went there out to uh, Ohio because they uh, had in their possession one of the original mental health consumer oriented websites, something called Mental Health Net. And uh, that had been founded. Oops, I'm going to turn this off. That had been founded in 1995. In 1999, it was three years old. Um, an enormous sum of money was being poured into that still very baby internet at that time. And that was just about the most exciting thing I could think of <laughs> at the time to do. So I did that and basically became the director of this website. And between 99 and 2011, that's what I did professionally. I did basically psychoeducation online for people around the world. So a lot of what I will talk to you about tonight did not exist in 1999 because the internet was still sort of nascent, if you will. It was just sort of coming into its own as a commercial property. And a lot of this sort of caught me by surprise because especially in tech, which moves so fast, if you sort of learn a particular way of doing things and you're not right at the edge, uh, and it's very hard to live right out on the edge where things are changing every six months, there's a new hotness, something new that you need to know, it, it's very easy to get caught by surprise and not realize how the world is changing. So a lot of this stuff that we'll talk about, particularly the evolution of the search engines and how to arrange a website uh, to rank in the search engines, was, was just simply stuff that we missed for a lot of years and uh, ultimately had to figure out what we were doing wrong and how the world had changed. So that's sort of how I know about this stuff. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, you can always run a presentation like this in a lot of different ways. Uh, my preference would be let's just ask the questions that you have when they're on your mind and uh, if things go too far, you know, off track, I'll redirect. Um, so basically, this is the game, <laughs> okay? Um, in order to, to talk about marketing yourself and your website, really getting your website noticed, the first thing to realize is the website is the avatar of you. The website is the avatar of your practice, or you if your practice is solo. It is the thing that people are probably going to find first, if not your website, then some other web property, for instance, a Psychology Today listing or something like that. And um, it is going to be something that people form an impression about you, how they come to know you first and form an impression about who you are and what you can do. 
as far as I can see it, it has two major purposes, and both of them are commercial. Um, <coughs> it is the means through which you can become noticed amongst the crowd of other people who are trying to be noticed for very similar work. It is a means of differentiating yourself, and uh, fortunately or unfortunately, there are rules for not what you produce, but how what you produce will be ranked and made public and made available to other people. And uh, that will form a large portion of what we'll talk about tonight. So the first purpose is simply getting your website noticed, which is probably the hardest problem. It didn't used to be like that. When I started doing websites, it was enough to just put something up, and it was just like, oh my god, a new website. Like, Let's go look at it. And now it's just like, you, you know, you almost want to beg people to look at your website now. You know, because there's just so much of this. So, understanding the rules of the game and how the game is played um, is, is extremely important for giving yourself a chance at getting noticed. The second purpose of the website I see as, okay, now that you've got someone to notice you, not necessarily because they noticed your website first, maybe they heard about you through another person who was a referral, um, maybe you gave a face-to-face -face human talk somewhere and you gave out a card and now someone is swinging around to check you out. Um, so, hand out here, pick up. right here. Um, the second sort of important purpose of the website is once they have found you, how can you use the website to get them to actually call you, right? What do you do that will help that proposition and what can you do that might hurt that proposition? So those are basically the, the sort of two things that uh, we need to talk about here. Now you notice that I actually have a, a second element here. It's not enough to get noticed. You need to be noticed by the local audience. When I did Mental Health Net, I would regularly get correspondence from people in Australia, and India, all over the world, which is great. It's wonderful, but they're not going to come see you. They're not going to come to your <laughs> office. And even if we could do that via teletherapy or something like that, it's actually, to be generous, a gray area. Right? Our licenses are basically bounded by the state we live in, and, and that's really what our liability insurance will cover, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's not enough to be noticed. We have to be noticed by people who are local. All right, um, a couple sort of beginning comments about getting noticed, about getting noticed by local people, and about converting people who come to visit your website, which is the marketing term for making a sale. Right? We generally don't talk that way, but that's what we're doing. Um, so the first thing that is probably extremely obvious is that a couple key players control how search works for websites. This is a little bit less of an issue for things like mobile apps, but for anything that has to do with the actual web world, you're going through a search engine. That means Google. And then in a very far distant second place, that means Bing and DuckDuckGo and a couple of the other search engines. And I guess we should mention Yahoo and AOL, although they're not really big Out of players. charity. <laughs> Out of charity, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So that's the first thing. The second thing, and this is probably the first technical term, is um, when you do a search on these search engines, what is returned is called a SERP, or a search engine ranking page. So you'll hear me talking about placing on the SERPs, okay? Um, the SERPs, of course, are divided into rows, each row an independent link with a little bit of descriptive information, and then at the bottom there's usually a link for the second page and the third page. As we're going to find out, if you're not in the first page, and if you're not at the top of the first page, nobody is going to see you, right? 
it's really a winner-take-all proposition. I find this unfortunate, but this is kind of the way that it typically is. It, it's not that no one will see you, but the probability of being seen goes down almost logarithmically. So that by the time you're on the second page, you're generally <coughs> into the 1% and 2% of people doing the search. Abby? Uh, I'm very challenged with these things, so maybe yeah. I'm not understanding something. But uh, how would you know what page you're, you're ranking, right? Like, because if somebody's, right, if somebody's looking up yeah. depression, or somebody's looking up relationships, or somebody's looking up CBT, right? Wouldn't you be in different? Yeah, well, it doesn't we'll, it depend on it, what. It'll make more sense as I go along because it doesn't make sense to talk about search engines until we get a chance to talk about keywords and how the keywords interact with the search results. So hold hold on to that for a moment. Um, but again, this is still just very general. What we're trying to do is to create web pages in such a way that the search engines can consume them most easily. What we're doing is we're trying to understand what the rules are that make a web page hard or easy for a search engine to consume. If a search engine cannot easily consume our content, it's not in the search engine. And if it's not in the search engine, we don't even get to start the race. We're just invisible. So, very, very important. Hey, uh, there's a handout somewhere. Um, the second thing, and so you may have you may have noticed this before. Um, I need this seat. You may have noticed this before, but when you do do a search, like on Google or, or any of these, not all the listings look the same anymore. Sometimes there's a listing that has a picture or it'll have some extra information associated with the listing. And those particular listings catch your eye, right? If you're scanning on a page of listings and one of them has a picture, your eyeball goes right to the picture. That's a way to game the system just a little bit because of the nature of how people track based on what is in front of them. We're talking about looking at a page of search results and you know sometimes one or two of those search results will have a picture or extra information. Those things are not there randomly. That little bit of extra information is called a snippet. It's called a rich snippet and we can do things to our web page which will encourage the search engine to make of that information a rich snippet, to dress the link up, which will increase the frequency that someone will click on. And we'll talk a little bit about how that is done. So first we're trying to get to the top of the search results, and secondly we're trying to put on our best <coughs> outfit so that someone wants to choose us versus someone else. All right. Um, Basically, we, we already sort of mentioned that it's not enough to be looked at. It's nice to be looked at by someone in Australia, but it's kind of irrelevant from a commercial purpose. We need to be looked at by people who can drive to our office. Or at the very least, we could do teletherapy with them legally. In order to do that, we have to communicate to the search engine that we are in a particular location. So in recent years, the branch of figuring out how to arrange your web page uh, to rank well in the SERPs, which is called SEO, or Search Engine Optimization, has uh, branched into subfields, one of which is called Local SEO. So it's a whole subfield of how do you place and rank within a geographic location. Um, one of the simplest ways to do this is and we haven't really talked about keywords yet, but it all sort of will fit together later, hopefully. I'll do it. I did the best I could to kind of figure out how to present the concepts, but there's just the critical mass of them that you need to have before it all makes sense. Basically, when we do a search, we're not doing a search against all content on the web. We're doing a search against a phrase that somebody has typed into the search engine, right? That phrase is called a keyword. This is extremely important. Think of the keyword as a kind of a Dewey Decimal System, if you remember how libraries are organized, right? 
in the library, there's a sort of number with a decimal point, right? And if you understand the meaning of that number as a code for subject matter, you can go right to that place in the stacks and suddenly there'll be all manner of stuff addressing that subject. On the internet, it was not imposed that way. There was no system that was imposed to create order. Rather, the search engine started to realize that people were typing in all of these various different phrases and they used the raw computing power to basically do concordances of all of these phrases against the content in which they were found. And they created basically a, a, a people-generated categorical system. So every single phrase that you can possibly imagine, and some of them, of course, are kind of collapsed, but every basic semantically meaningful combination of words is now an independent column of search results within Google. Each one of those columns is a separate ranking task, right? So that's basically what a keyword is. It's all organized around one, and generally only one, it could be more than one, but generally one keyword that your content is going to be assigned to. And the best way to think about this is when you're creating the content, you want to be thinking about the keyword that you're trying to rank within. Right? So, we're basically constructing our content around the keywords that we think are relevant. Knowing that, we can use geographic tags, which are meaningful, which are going to um, help the search engine to know where we are. Now, this is the easiest way to do it. It's also the crudest way to do it, because there are other Bay Areas. Right? Yeah. If we were um, manipulating some of these things to see how it affects our rankings, how long does it take for a search engine to be able to catch up with changes? It's reasonably quick. Um, I mean, it depends on how quickly you your content is being spidered or re-indexed mm -hmm. by the search engine. Um, very popular websites are constantly spidered. Ones that are going to be the kind that we operate are less frequently spidered. Uh, there are ways to request a spidering mm -hmm. through something like what is called Google Webmaster Tools. Mm -hmm. things of that nature. So you can actually basically go into Google and um, there are a couple different ways to do it. Another way is with a sitemap. Most software today that we would use to create a website is going to generate a sitemap for us. We won't even notice that it's there. Mm -hmm. But essentially a sitemap is a machine readable instruction set which tells the search engine, which knows where to find it because there's a specification. It's always in the same location with the same name and the same formatting. These are all the links on my website. So when that changes, then the search engine knows to come back around and take another look at your content. So you don't have to notify it that you have a new site now? They'll eventually figure it out. Um, if you want them to come sooner, there are a couple different ways that you can do that. I, I, I'm not prepared to say exactly how that's done, but there are ways. And it's always just a request. They do what they want. Like, you know, we just raise our hand, please, mm -hmm. you know, come and find me. So does quickly mean days or hours or weeks? Or, you know, I don't really yeah. have a context for it. Um, probably, I, I, I really couldn't tell you, but certainly days, okay. generally. And sitemap changes whenever we make changes? Or if your software has that feature about it, for instance, something like WordPress, like you were using, um, we'll do that just transparently. Yeah, you don't need to think about it, but it's something that's happening in the background. I'll show you a sitemap on my, on my practice website. When you talk about keywords, is that any text on the website, or is it... Uh, headings, or is that page? Yeah. Um, Google and the other search engines, there's no place where they just say, like, you know, here's where the keywords are, right? There was a place like that originally, and it was 
fraudulently used, so they totally de-emphasize that. They basically will scan through the first number of words on any given page, and they will intuit what it must be. And we have the opportunity by strategically placing keywords in particular places on the, on the page to tell them what we want them to conclude. We can't force them to conclude anything, but we can give them a strong hint. And they like that. They, they want help. So we'll, we'll cover what those parts of the web pages are. This might be jumping ahead, but I have got, I use a Weebly, and it actually gives you the option of putting in your keywords. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of meaningless? Do they still look up just the pages? I think it's yeah. more meaningless than it used to be. Okay. Um, I will go through the source of one of the pages on my personal practice website, and we'll, sh we'll, we'll talk about that. But there used to be sort of what are called meta tags. There are still meta tags. They live at the beginning of the web page in a part of the web page that's not visible except to the spiders. And, um, and the spiders being the, the robot pieces of software that comb through the web and, and try to keep everything indexed and up to date. Um, and it used to be that you could tell, like, here's the keyword section, right? But less and less do they trust that because it's been so badly and fraudulently used. So, um, so we can we can do this sort of through keywords. There's also a variety of much newer techniques where we can actually tell by embedding semantic information hidden visible to the human eye semantic information into the page which will tell any search engine, any modern search engine, exactly where you are down to the physical address and including how to contact you. Okay? So that is probably the best way to do it. Almost all of the software that you're using today will support that but you may need to use special plugins to make that happen. Okay? And talk about that later if you wish. Finally, and I'm going to make this more explicit later, there's sort of two kinds of search results, right? There's the kind we always think of which is called organic or natural search results. That's the kind we really want to place highly on. And then there's the payola, right? If I pay enough money, Google will put me high up on a page. And that's the stuff either at the very top of the page, at the very bottom of the page, or along the right column. Those are the ads. And a lot of people kind of poo-poo the ads, and I personally have not found a great deal of success with them, mostly just because they've become so expensive. But with the ads, one of the nice features about them is you can tell Google right down to the neighborhood where you want those to be displayed and where you do not want them to be displayed. You have very fine-grained control over the location where those ads would be displayed. So these are all different ways you can sort of be local. Fine. Uh, question. When you say you can specify like where the ads will be yeah. placed, mm -hmm. does that mean that the people like in that location, it'll come up on those computers and the people in that area? Yeah. Or, ah. Explicitly within that geographic location and nowhere else. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Right. Remember, they know where you are. Mm -hmm. How do you go about getting these ads? Uh, AdWords. Uh, AdWords.google.com. I'm not going to talk very much about ads. It's a very complicated, to do it right, it's actually very complicated. Um, I could talk about that another evening if people were so interested. Okay. It's not merely the case that we want to be noticed. We want to be noticed and chosen, right? Being chosen is a separate task than being noticed. I encourage you to think about it separately, okay? What is going to convince people to choose you? Well a number of different kinds of features of how your website looks, how it's arranged, and how it performs are going to influence that decision. One of the things that I'm going to say again and again is that your website has to be furiously fast. It has to load very quickly. If it 
doesn't load very quickly, people will click again and go somewhere else. This is what the research shows. <coughs> now, let's say your website does load very quickly, okay? You don't have very much time to communicate your message to the person at the other end because people have no attention span anymore, right? You've, you've, seriously, you've got a second or two, and this is almost like a Malcolm Gladwell blink kind of stuff, right? It's like you need to convey through the aesthetics of your website and through very carefully crafted and simple and right up front language, which is in marketing speak known as copy, through your copy and through how you make it easy for people to contact you or don't, you have to make the case very quickly so someone who's just giving you a second or two is convinced instantly this person can, can solve my problem, this person can, this person is competent, this person is able to address what I'm going through, I believe in this person at least tentatively versus while well, this person looks like someone from the last century, I don't know if I can trust them. It's that sort of thing. It's this emotional kind of impression that somebody's going to get that's going to convince them to either pick up the telephone or send you a quick email or something like that. Um, so we'll talk about different sorts of things, but this has to do with sort of what does your website look like, how is it arranged, terms of the navigation and the pages, what is the copy, what is your sales argument, including something we'll talk about called a call to action, which is very important. <coughs> and then finally, speed, 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 speed. <laughs> it has to be fast, because if people have to sit around and wait, they won't. All right. Um, probably all familiar with the stages of change model, particularly anyone who studied addiction, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the marketer's version of stages of change. This is like the stages of making a sale. <laughs> okay? Um, so the first thing is, do they even know that you exist? Right? So that's getting noticed. The second thing is basically, oh, I know they exist, and wow, that looks good. Right? So now you've captured their attention a little bit. Not only does it look good, I want that. I want this therapist. And then finally, I'm going to pick up the phone and call. I'm going to send an email. I'm going to do something. You need to progress people through these stages. This is the task of the website and any other sort of marketing activities that you do. You're trying to convince people that you have what they need. So, um, how does the website relate to that? Well, again, the website and how you have arranged the content and the pages and all of these different aspects of how the website operates and how it's laid out and all of those things are going to make the difference between you getting noticed or not, and once you're noticed, whether they decide to select you to contact you. Okay? So to sort of tie all of this conceptual stuff together. Does this all make sense so far? All right. Can I ask a question? I didn't get this fast enough before you switched the slide. But what was that? What were the other um, examples of, of um, being found um, oh, in terms local? of location Google Plus? And, and the yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about okay. local explicitly. All right. um, but basically there are, there are semantic elements that you can embed directly into the page, one of the most important of which is getting a Google Plus um, account. You probably all have that already, whether you wanted one or not. Uh, but to actually start using that, and the key thing to do is when you use Google at all and have a Google account, they give you a Plus account, but it is a personal account. There is something called pages within your personal account where you can create an, a separate thing for your practice. Once you do that, you will have a page for your practice. That page will have information such as what is your telephone number and what are your hours and where are you located. 
and that page will have an URL, right? A website address. What you need to do is to link that website address probably in the footer of your web page. So now whenever Google spiders your web page, it knows that this web page is associated with this Google Plus profile, which has a geographic location. And that is one way to tell Google where you are. So I'll, I'll show you this on my personal website. Okay. Um, all right. I wanted to say this, just, I mean, we're totally focusing on the web tonight, but the task of doing this is way bigger than just your website. Your website is, is the digital thing over which you have the most control, maybe, but there's other kinds of things that are going on here, specifically social media accounts that you may operate, um, different kinds of websites or different ways of using websites. Um, specifically, the marketing tasks of the website are sometimes separated from the content tasks of the website, such that you might have a practice page, which is fairly simple, and you might have a blog or something like that, and those are not necessarily under the same domain. You might have two or three websites, ultimately, for different purposes, depending on how you want to arrange it and what your tolerance is for this sort of pain. Um, <laughs> so. What I'm trying to get at is you want to think about this as a series of things you're doing, all of which refer to each other, right? If you're on the website, you talk about the talk that you're going to give next week. And if you're at the talk, you leave materials there that have your website, right? You're trying to get basically a funnel of attention coming in, and you're trying to direct it to the website so that the website can fulfill its secondary purpose, which is to convince people to select you, right? Is it more advantageous to have your blog um, in the same domain, or is it better to have them separate and have them linked? I, I really don't know the answer to that. It is advantageous to have a blog. Um, I think I could argue both ways, okay. and probably what it comes down to is whatever is easier, because if doing it the right way means you don't have a blog, that's probably the worst decision. It's better to do it the wrong way, but still have the blog. Okay. Just, just have the blog. The blog is important. Why is that? Because um, one of the factors that Google is taking into account as it ranks and categorizes your pages for any given keyword that you are trying to rank on is how new the content is. Right? Mm -hmm. So. If you create content and it is new today, tomorrow it will not be new. Google will give more weight and therefore a higher position in the SERPs to things that are perpetually renewing. And things that are static and just sitting out there are not going to get a lot of attention. They're still important. I'm not saying that just having a static marketing website is not important. It's very important. But it's more important for that secondary purpose of once someone has found you, convincing them to select you, and less important for getting noticed. So does it make a difference between whether you have a blog or whether you're just changing content in other places? Uh, they know the difference between minor changes to a page and major changes to a page and new pages. So. I don't know exactly how they do it, but they're that mm -hmm. good. And with, with the keywords, I get, I'm still a little confused about how you develop that. Yeah, I'll talk about that. I mm -hmm. haven't gotten to my keywords section yet. Um, all right, so we already, we already made this distinction, basically. This is the most important aspect of it, or organic search or natural search. You want to be in the part of the results where people trust it because you didn't pay money to be there. It was like, according to Google, and in some sense it's actually true, you were voted by the other mass of websites and properties in the interlinks between them. Your property was voted up into a particular position, and that conveys a signal of merit. That's why people trust it more, supposedly. Right? So, 
But just because this is not as prestigious doesn't mean it isn't important. I think probably at least marketers where more money is changing hands at any given moment would use paid search very heavily and they would try to create content that was also ranking organically. It's just that at the scale of our businesses, I think it may not pan out so well just because the competition has gotten so high and the expense of doing the advertising, I think, is kind of outweighing the merit of it at this point. What is at least oh. uh, Google being? Dug, dug. Oh, yeah, these are different search engines. So Google's the one everybody knows. This is Microsoft search engine being. DuckDuckGo is an up-and-coming one. Uh, the big claim to fame that it has is that they don't track you, right? So whatever you do on Google is basically a fingerprint, and Google is paying very careful attention to everything you're looking at. And they do this algorithmically, and the way they get away with it is they don't explicitly link it to your name and your social security number, not that they couldn't in a moment if they wanted to. But basically, they have got a profile of how you behave. And they are tracking everything you look at. Everything. Right? So DuckDuckGo came along and they said, we'll do a good search engine. We promise we won't do that. So a lot of the people who are a little bit more savvy about this privacy stuff have started to convert over to DuckDuckGo. Just because, uh, you know, it's nice to have a little privacy. <laughs> uh, so this one is a little newer. These guys are older properties that are probably, uh, as we said before, we're just being charitable <laughs> by mentioning them. But they're still, you know, they're still players. But those are the, these are the folks that you're trying to impress. And really, Google is it. Google runs the show. Google is the 800-pound gorilla. So search engine optimization, what is it? I mentioned it before. Search engine optimization is the science or art or whatever you want to call it. It is the field concerned with organizing your web pages such that they will rank more highly. They will come out at the top of the SERPs for any given keyword you are trying to rank on. There are sort of two aspects to this. Um, one is the semantics and the syntax, really the syntax even more, of how the underlying web page is constructed. What signals it provides that are invisible to the human eye, but are extremely visible to the machine eye, right? We're trying to create pages for two audiences, and this is really important and not obvious. We are definitely trying to create a page that a human being likes, but equally so, we are trying to create a page that Google's machine robot overlords like. Okay? If they don't like us, we will be invisible. So that's what all this is about. Now, in SEO, that is typically divided into sort of two categories. One is called internal SEO, and the other is called external SEO. That might be last year's terms. I think there are new terms this year. But it's a useful distinction nevertheless. What I just described, structuring the pages so that machines can consume them, is what used to be referred to as internal SEO. External SEO is a whole other thing, and it is also extremely important and actually harder. External SEO is the business of getting your content to be linked to by other prominent properties in the same general category as yourself, right? So this is hard because this is the part where we have to go asking people to notice us. And not just to notice us and consume our work, but actually to point to it and reference it, right? This is getting other people to toot our horn. If we don't do this, we don't place as highly in the SERPs. And the reason is because one of the most prominent signals that Google uses and all of these other websites that came after Google to figure out what is a property worth featuring and what is not is by looking at the pattern of how sites link to each other. 
a site that has more other properties linking into it, particularly other properties that are themselves well linked in, inbound links, links coming from another property to a page on your website. That is the primary signal that this is an important property that should be featured highly. Right? And this is the reason why it is extremely difficult for a new property to, to feature well within the service. Um, let's say you, you have an ad out on uh, Psychology Today and mm -hmm. you have your website there. Is that, is that an example of what you... Yeah, you Psychology think? Today is great. And the reason they're great is because a million people link in to Psychology Today. Their trust ratings for Google, based mm -hmm. on how other people regard them by voting with their feet to create a link back to Psychology Today, very, very high. That means that when somebody searches for a therapist, what's actually happening from the point of view of Google is they're saying, who do we trust the most to, you know, to put at the top because we want to give people information that's most relevant. So how do we know what's most relevant? Well, we'll go with these sites where other people are consistently linking in to them. And Psychology Today is extremely good at that. They are the number one website service of their type. And that's why they get referrals. And that's why even the number two isn't as good. Because their SEO is not as good as Psychology Today's. They don't have that same bulk mass of inbound links and whatever else is necessary to make that happen. Yes? How about professional organizations that have find the therapist section? Yeah. The reason those don't work, or might work only in very specifically narrow categories, is because their SEO is typically terrible, right? They're not well searched by anybody but the people who are members of those organizations, with rare exceptions. Um, so. There are, you know, prominent clinics like the Mayo Clinic that got in the game very early and did a lot of consumer-focused health education. <laughs> so even though they were primarily a hospital system, they have gotten so much credibility on the web based on being there for a very long time, having other people say, wow, that's a great resource, I'll just link to that rather than creating my own, that they now... <coughs> feature very highly on any search that you might do for a medical thing. And think about what they did. They ensured, by spending money on that, they ensured that they stay very high in the public eye on searches for medical terms, which in, which in turn feeds their physical medicine business. Right? It was a very strategic decision that they made. And they not only now are making money hand over fist doing medicine, they also do all sorts of pharmaceutical ads, mm -hmm. which is a very lucrative business, let me tell you. Um, so, yes? Sorry, what about health grades in Manta and those kind of things? Yeah, that's a little different. Um, there's a whole sort of genre of website that has sprung up where basically they get the list of who's licensed across many different fields and they'll put up an, a profile that's algorithmic. Uh, in other words, they've got a database that they called from some state registrar and they're just generating a, a page. And what you'll find with most of those is they're very poorly used. For instance, they're almost all trying to solicit people to rank the doctor or rank the therapist or something like that. How many times have you actually seen a rating? Very few. And the reason is because nobody pays attention to that, <laughs> right? So it's a it's a problem of um, the stone in motion. It's an inertia kind of a problem. How do you get a page to be interesting? Once it's already considered to be interesting, there's so much traffic coming into it that it kind of perpetuates itself. But it's very difficult to get something new to be well regarded. And particularly when something is generated like that, it's more boring to a human being. So people are less likely to link to it. The fact that psychology today works as well as they do is kind of mind-boggling. But they were one of the early players in that space, and they have really come to dominate it. This is what I was saying before about a winner-take-all kind of a game. The 
this is just how these things work or have worked. Does psychology today work well for certain types of keywords, or is that unclear? That's a good question, and I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm responding more just to the, the overall sense that they are very, very good at the whole game of this, and they've gotten themselves into the first position overall. Now, that ensures that they, for a range of keywords, are going to be shown first, or first or second or third or fourth. They'll be shown in that small window of results where people actually do most of their clicking. So that just becomes more self-perpetuating. One, one um, suggestion that someone gave me mm -hmm. was to, if you're considering signing up for a directory, to um, take the name of someone that you know is on the directory and Google it and see whether their listing on that directory shows up anywhere on that first page mm -hmm. of results. Or if, so, or if it's one you're already on, then deciding whether it's worth the money or not, I think yeah. that might be one way to do it. Because I know there are other these other factors that you're talking about that can make your ranking higher or lower, but if they're not even showing up at all, then it's probably not worth paying to put your name on it. Yeah. Um, for the average person who is not really a, you know, a prominent producer of content, how many places are you going to really have your name out on the web? Well, it's probably mostly going to be social media, where you might be active if you're active there at all. Um, you know, if you've, if you've got a Google profile, that will probably come up because Google likes to favor their own <laughs> properties, stuff like that. So, you know, you have control over this to some extent, uh, but, you, but it is your choice to invest your time and energy in producing content and then structuring that content. Even then, mm -hmm. this is still just an incredibly difficult thing to do. It is hard to do. It didn't used to be, but it's become extremely hard to do. I have some ideas about how we can help each other, which I'll sort of save for the end. Um, do yeah. you use uh, the Google Plus professional page? Do you have to use a Google email or will it work for using other emails? No, they, they don't care about that. They don't care about that. Um, Alright, well, we already talked about this. This is the key one that's really important and this is the one that we're trying to um, figure out how do we rise. And I want to point out here that some very, very bright people, some of whom who are criminals, <laughs> think about this stuff and are constantly trying to figure out how can I get my Viagra ads to the top, my penis pills or whatever they're selling. How can I get my stuff to the top of the SERPs? And all kinds of amazing things have happened. Just to tell you a little anecdote. Uh, years ago, when I ran Mental Health Net, we found uh, that some group in the Ukraine had infiltrated into our server code, which, you know, being cult, but we, our security wasn't so good. But they had figured out how to infiltrate and piggyback on the back of our domain so that under certain circumstances, uh, their Viagra ads would be shown on our web page. Oh. More recently, I did some consulting work for a peer, um, one of our fellows, right? And what she, what the basic finding was, was that um, when she was searching under certain pages, some Viagra kinds of ads were coming up, but she couldn't find any reference to the Viagra ads in the actual um, code, you know, anything that she had produced. So I went searching, it was a WordPress site, I went searching through it, and uh, I found that someone had injected this uh, very complicated looking bit of code that didn't belong there. And you could tell, like, this is just weird stuff, it doesn't really belong here, everything else makes sense, and this makes no sense at all. And um, I figured out what they had done, because it's they're not that clever, I mean, there are certain kinds of techniques that they use, but they had scripted this thing and passed it through this filter that reversed it and then they had rotated it by seven characters or whatever and they had this thing anyway the way it worked was for any domain other than Google that would show the content that she had in her website 
and for Google, it would show Viagra ads. <laughs> <laughs> so she was totally hijacked in this very stealthy way, right? And she never would have figured it out if she wasn't Googling herself. It just would have lived there forever. So there's some very, very smart criminals out there. And Google is also very, very smart. So as you can imagine, this is an arms race, right? Google is constantly updating their secret algorithm. And all of the criminals and all of the other people who are trying to keep up with it are constantly trying to figure out what Google is doing, right? Because there's a lot of money to be made in Viagra. Um, so where I'm trying to go with this is that this is a moving target and there's no way you'll keep up with it because even the pros can't. All right, we talked about internal and external SEO. All right. Um, this is on the handout that I gave you. This is the one I recommend. This is like lots of the little details for what is important. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a pile of um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through what some of these important things are in a moment. But uh, as, I, as I looked at a bunch of these tutorials, which are sort of like, you know, introduction to SEO, what are the basic concepts, what do you need to know? I like this one the best. I think it's it's most easily consumed. Many of you will be tempted to hire an SEO expert, and that is not necessarily a bad thing. You should know that it will be very expensive, perhaps prohibitively expensive, and that um, it is something to to think very carefully about because so many people are so bad at it and so many people are explicitly unethical. In this world, uh, the world is divided into white hats and black hats. The white hats are the good guys, the black hats are the bad guys. Um, those are those criminals I was talking about. Um, the black hats can be very effective. And even the white hats can be very effective, but remember, the game is constantly changing. So what was fair game a year ago might now be ver verboten, or whatever the word is, right? Um, the way Google sort of sends out directives here, they really want you to focus on creating content. They don't want you to be clever about how you present the content. And the more clever you try to be, particularly if you get a technical person out there who's trying to do something technical to be clever to stand out, <coughs> I think the way the conventional wisdom now is shaping up is that that's just a short-term strategy and ultimately Google's going to figure that particular loophole out and close it. And when they close it, they will penalize your website. Right? Um, just to give you some sense for sort of how this happens, um, part of the business of Mental Health Net for many years, part of the way our little company supported ourselves was we actually took a lot of the content from Mental Health Net and we reused it by private labeling it for other uh, community mental health centers and employee assistance programs. So we might have the same article in 70 or 80 or 100 different locations. That was always a bad thing to do. But for years, it was kind of OK, and Mental Health Net didn't really suffer for it. Somewhere around 2010, Google came down hard on that. And in the span of a week, we lost fully 40% of our traffic. OK, so if we were seeing 900,000 people visiting the website in a given week, Take 40% of that away, and think about that in terms of advertising revenue, right? That's 40% of your revenue gone, bam, arbitrary, no appeal, right? So that's the kind of thing they can do. They operate with impunity. There are no rules except the ones they make. So tread very, very lightly, and if you do accept consulting services from someone, you, you just want someone who kind of is super careful. And the, the thing about that is 
if they are super careful, in some sense they're less likely to be effective. <laughs> because they're not doing those things that are really going to game the system to get a lot of attention. So from Google's perspective, <coughs> focus on creating really amazing, good content that people want to read and don't worry about all this other stuff or we will hurt you. That's sort of the way they will talk about it. Now, the other wrinkle, which is unique to our profession in some sense, is we have very specific rules about how we're allowed to promote ourselves, right? Ethics code stuff. And almost none of these people are going to appreciate that. If they do appreciate that, it'll be something like, oh, you know, those clients have these ethical prohibitions. They won't come from that world. They won't appreciate it. So again, just be very careful about that, right? Okay, um, so what are some things that make a site, th this is sort of the secondary purpose that I was talking about again. Um, we've got someone to come to the website, how do we convince them to select us? What are some of the factors that are really important? Well, we want the site to be attractive. That's important. From my perspective, attractive means something maybe different than some of you might think. Um, it's not so much that it is beautiful in an artistic sense, but more that it is clean and modern looking enough. That it does not convey a sense of, oh, that site was designed in 1995 and has not been <laughs> updated. You could get away with a wide variety of aesthetics, but if you don't have that, in my, in my way of thinking about things, you're sending an aesthetic signal that you're out of step with the times. And even though you might be a perfectly great therapist, that's just the first impression. Is that the first impression you want someone to have of you? Probably not. So, attractive. Responsive. This is new within the last three or four years. Within the last three or four years, something amazing and unprecedented has happened, and that is that more people <coughs> look at websites on their mobile phones now than on laptops and desktops. Desktops, what's that? <laughs> right? Let's face it, mostly we have laptops and we have phones and maybe we have a tablet or two. Right? More people are now using a touch interface and looking at your website on a very tiny screen than on the full-size screen. Now, this is unprecedented. The web was always a full-size screen. And for many, many years, the way that the website, the typical website was designed was it had a fixed width. What that means is it needed a screen which was going to be able to display a certain number of pixels wide. And if the screen could not display a certain number of pixels wide, you would only see a portion of the website. That was not a problem because we all knew that the average laptop was going to be at least, you know, a thousand pixels wide, so we could safely have a 900 pixel wide website. We can't count on that anymore because there's so much diversity in the width, the pixel width, the effective width of the screens that people are using, and also, we can no longer count on certain kinds of things which used to be gospel, like if I move the mouse over a link, right, it'll show me a hover state. A hover state, what's that? Right? We're now having to think in terms of touch interfaces where there is no hover state. It's either clicked or not clicked. So a lot of the old ways that websites have been designed kind of gone out the window, or at least receive some major surgery. The solution that a lot of folks have gone towards is something called a responsive website. And that is a website that has intelligence built into it so that it knows how to redeploy its assets for a small screen, a medium-sized screen, and a large screen. Right? How many of you have smartphones and you've looked at some of the websites out there and you see like the full website, but it's very, very tiny, right? And then maybe you can click on the column of text and it gets a little bigger, but it's still like you can't read it, right? Do you stay on those pages? No, of course not. You go away. 
this is one of those signs of the times that you need to be thinking about. The text needs to change with the width of the screen. So quickly, let me show you what does that mean. Uh, all right, come on. All right, so here is my website. And this is my website at laptop width. Uh, I'm going to grab the corner here and I'm going to start dragging it in. Laptop width, laptop width. Uh oh. It changed. Right? Notice that the whole navigation is different now. Okay? Now it's a mobile site. What used to be the sidebar <coughs> is down at the bottom. The elements that were in the footer that were in separate columns are now stacked. This is a responsive website. And then if I pull it back out, it will change itself. When I've talked to designers, they seem to use the term optimized for mobile. I mean, that seems to be their buzzword. <laughs> and you have to find a template that, that, yeah, that optimizes um, your website for mobile but application. You, but you don't want to focus exclusively on mobile either because there are still plenty of people using laptops. You want a site. This is fortunately very easy to do because it's, it's widely available today. You don't have to design this from scratch. You can buy a template that already does this. But you need to know that that's important. Okay? Yes? Can I ask a random question? I guess, yeah. Um, uh, when you have that thing over there that says clients, uh -huh. and clients can go in there and there's like a password, uh -huh. is that part of your website or is that like a different system? That's a part of the website that I put on this website, yeah. It's not different. So meaning it's not like one of those like um, like Clinico or or those. It's not a separate service. It's something I control utterly. Mm -hmm. What's Clinico? Meaning a lot of people have these um, like clients, and you go up there, and they have like um, a password that you go in. But I know that they have these services like yeah. Clinico or I something think, notes. I think, like I think that's going to take us a little bit of field mm -hmm. right now. Because I know that those are part of maintaining something online, right? Like mm -hmm. they go into the website yeah, and they I mean, can I, I've done some things do assessments. Here that, that might not be for the average bear, um, and that's why those services exist. Because this is this could be a business, right? Having a private protected area for your clients. Mm -hmm. If it isn't a business already, yeah. So, so what I mean is, if if you're if you don't know about these things, you would get one of those services, like you, you easily could, sure. But, but let's come back to this task here. Um, so responsive, uh, the site adapts to the width in which it is looked at, and not just, not just the rearrangement of the navigation. If you were to look at this on the smartphone, the text would be big. You wouldn't be squinting to look at it. The, the font size is also adjusting, although you can't see it right there. Um, a responsive website kind of knows what is being used to look at it and will adapt its text, its navigation, um, in some cases right down to which version of the images it's sending, a big one or a small one, um, so that you end up with something optimized for the particular platform that you're on. And that's more and more the trend and I strongly recommend this. Very Where do you important. buy such templates? Anywhere. I mean, okay. If you're using a modern CMS or content management system like WordPress, well... GoDaddy does all of this. Yeah, GoDaddy's bad. <laughs> um, but yes, they do. It's not hard to find. You just need to know what to look for. right? It's, it's really widely available. Um, so the copy or the sort of persuasive argument that you're making needs to be prominent. It needs to be very simple, 
and it needs to have something which we could call a call to action, meaning something which is going to convince people to take an action right now. Don't wait because you'll be off to the races somewhere else if you wait. Act now, right? This is extremely important and one of the biggest mistakes I see. People have a page for their contact information, right? It's not immediately available except as a link that says contact, right? That's not good enough because you're making the viewer work, right? Don't think of them as a thoughtful person who's sitting there going through your website, trying to make sense out of your website. They're not. They're there and they're going to spend a second or two trying to figure out something about that. And at the very least, you want your contact information prominently in the header, right? So they don't have to scroll to find it, and it should be on every single page. You'll notice what I do. Um, I have a little form that's built right into the website, and it follows you down the page. Oops. So, you know, if we go down, it'll just keep itself right in the field of vision. <coughs> okay? Now, here's the other thing. I have what's called a call to action. Alright? It's the most colorful thing on the page, and it's giving a command. And that Con launches the, um, the email that they're filling in, or, or the information they're filling in on the form. This will literally form. send me an email. I mean, if they click the blue button. Yeah, it'll take whatever, it'll take whatever information is in the form and will send me an email. So is that pick up in the Um, No. No. At this point, they're not my client. With, oh, so they don't tell you what their problem is, they just give you the contact information? Well, the orange text helps with that. This form will send an unencrypted regular plain text email. It should not be considered secure or private. Okay. We should have a lawyer to review this sort of stuff. <laughs> This is what a call to action is. Make an appointment, contact. What you could do, if you wanted to be more careful, is to use a service like Hushmail. I'm not sure exactly how this would interface with it. That's what you can have it delivered to your Hushmail. It's a, it's a topic for another presentation. In that case, it wouldn't be that difficult to change this to behave in that fashion. Um, the other thing that you can do to make it a little bit more HIPAA compliant is you could make this into a secured website, HTTPS. That is actually now a signal that Google is using to prioritize one website over another. If the website is secure, it will get a little bit a bump in the waiting system. Could you say that, I'm sorry, one more time you pointed to some place? Oh. Uh, you know that you sometimes will go to a website and it'll be green, mm -hmm. right? And it'll have a little lock that's locked, mm -hmm. right? If you look carefully, what you'll see is that the actual protocol, sometimes you can see it. Have you ever seen the links where they say HTTP, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. HTTP is the non-secure version of the transport protocol. Oh. HTTPS, S for secure, is the, the secured version. What that means when you see that is that whenever something is transmitted, for instance, the contents of the form, it would be encrypted across the wire. Not very strong encryption in most cases, but better than nothing. How, how do you get the secure website? How do you, you have to purchase something called an SSL certificate. They are as inexpensive as $10 and it has to be installed, and that is a bit of a technical thing beyond the reach of most of you. And when you say secure, that would mean anything that gets sent through it. 
uh, yeah, any, anything that would be transmitted. In this case, most of the time there is nothing being transmitted. You're requesting a page and the page is coming back. Mm -hmm. So the page is being transmitted, but there's nothing on it that has anything to do with anybody. But if you encrypted your email, would that make your site secure in terms of the HTTPS criteria? HTTPS is simply a protocol which allows anything that is being transmitted from the website uh, to a particular endpoint to be done in a encrypted manner. So yes, if this was, if I had the certificate set up for this website, whenever someone clicked on this, it would be encrypted until it got to the other server. If the other server was not itself a HIPAA compliant thing, then it wouldn't matter. <laughs> But Google likes them, you said. Google does like. Apparently, Google likes that now. It's a big. Uh, it's a big new thing. Um, contact information. So you see how I've handled that, right? It's on. It's on literally every page <coughs> that follows you around, right? And it's also colorful, right? The action button is colorful. It's so you're sort of using all that good Rorschach stuff, you know, color shock. You're trying to attract the eye to the call to action. And you're using explicit and demanding language. Take an action, right? All right. Um, we said that the page has to load quickly. How do we do that? Now, this is a technical issue. And probably you're, you're trying to hire someone who's going to do this for you. But many of you are probably also going to be doing stuff like using GoDaddy as your host or something like that. And I don't know that GoDaddy is going to particularly pay attention to this sort of thing. This is a case where you sort of get what you pay for. And it's very inexpensive, but it's also not going to be set up as well as it could be. So um, there's a variety of techniques which are used to create very fast loading web pages. The simplest thing is called front-end caching. Now, most of you are going to be using a content management system software package like, like uh, WordPress, right? And the thing to know about these is that there is no single place where the page lives, right? These are sort of complicated little systems, and they've got the sort of what's called the template over here, which is the outer portion of what the page looks like, and the content is stored somewhere else in the database. And when you request a page, what's actually happening is the server saying, oh, we need that page, so grab the template, get this stuff out of the database, shove it in here, find the images over here, here, and here, and throw it out. It's working to assemble the page every single time. And that creates what's called latency. Right? Latency is time. It takes some time for that to occur. So what a front-end cache does <coughs> is it sort of acts as a little storage closet, like right at the front of the website. And as that page is assembled, a copy of the page is stored in the cache, fully assembled so that it does not have to be reassembled, and it is time-stamped. So let's say you set the cache to display the same page for an hour, right? If that same page is requested within the hour, the first thing that the software will do is look to see if there's a reasonably fresh copy of the page in the closet. If there is, nothing more will happen but the retrieval of that page and throw it back out. It takes much less time because it's not having to put anything together. Right? On my particular web page, I use something called a front-end cache to accomplish this. It happens to be called Varnish. There are lots of these. That name is not particularly important. The phrase to write down is front-end cache. And probably, if you want a service which is going to do this for you, you're going to have to pay a little bit more for it. Um, the higher-end WordPress hosting sites will do this for you, and they'll have some fancy marketing-speak name for what it is. But essentially what they'll be communicating to you is that they have a front-end cache, which dramatically speeds up the process of putting the pages out. 
Now, um, another thing, here's, a, here's another thing that's a big mistake that a lot of people make. We've all got our phones and we take pictures, right? And sometimes we put pictures into our web pages. A lot of times we do not optimize the pictures for the web. So what that means is we're taking a picture which is fully two and a half megabytes <laughs> in size and we're sticking that whole big honking file up there and it looks okay, right? Like we put it up and it stays in the page and it looks fine. But it is a giant file for the visual information that's being communicated. There are techniques where you can take that same file and squish it down to much, much smaller, like by magnitude of 8 or 10 or something ridiculous. And yes, it will lose some of its crispness, but you can find a sweet spot where it's much smaller, but it's still plenty crisp. And that's what you want to do. The reason you want to do that is not because it looks better, it's because that file will come down and load faster. If you don't do it, you're forcing people to download a very big file, which on a 3G network or even a 4G network is going to take extra time and add to the latency of your site loading. So that's a mistake. Can um, you manually just push it down? You can. You need a particular kind of software to do it. Um, most image processing software will do something like that. And I could create a tutorial for how to do it. It's not that hard. There are actually websites you can go to where you upload the big file and it gives you yeah. a squished down version of the other, so you don't even need software. You could do it if you email it to your phone and then you email it to yourself. Yeah. When and you then email, you that's another way to do it, but so it's, you have less control over the process in that way, but the phone will do that automatically when you email a picture. Oh. Right? They're just sort of saying like, well, we're not going to send this whole file. It's too big. So that's something. Now, here's another thing. Um, so you saw on my website that thing follows you around, that little form follows mm -hmm. you around. How did I make that happen? That's an animation. Um, so a website is built out of a number of different technologies. There's HTML, well, there's actual text, then there's what we call HTML. HTML has to do with instructions for how things should be formatted. Then there's something called CSS, or Cascading Style Sheets. That has to do with how it's dressed up. That has to do with sort of the clothes it's wearing. And then there's something called JavaScript. JavaScript is the way that web pages get animated. And many of you will have animations on your web page. A very popular one today is called a slider. And um, it'll be like a picture, and then the picture dissolves to be replaced by another picture, and then that dissolves to be replaced by another picture, and then it kind of resets and keeps doing that, right? And the idea is someone's going to come to our site, and we'll show them three different things we want them to link to, and if they click on the picture, we'll go there. Well, every time the page loads, we're not only sending them a big image, unless we've decided that we're going to be clever and squish it down, we're also forcing their local computer to run JavaScript, which isn't that big a deal on a laptop. But on a phone, that's bad news, because most phones are just not that powerful. And JavaScript is just a resource, <coughs> even though it's better than it used to be. So we want to be very, very careful with excessive things like sliders, particularly on a mobile site. So the way to do that is you must have your slider, and it's perfectly fine to do it, you just have to be thoughtful about what you're doing, is, and you, you, might, you might need someone more technical to help you to do this, but um, the way that a responsive site works is with something called media, uh, media queries, and it's literal instructions that tell it, follow these particular cascading style sheet rules for how the site should look at a particular page width range. So if we're within this numerical value for pixel width, follow these instructions. And if we're outside that, follow the instructions in this other block. So what you'd want to do with a slider is, for the smaller screen widths, you'd want to just not have that thing download, not be part of the page. Don't show it. Right? 
spare the phone. <laughs> and then when the page gets wider, if someone's looking at it on, you know, a more beefy machine like a laptop, well then, sure, fine. Do that. Um, finally, if you want to be very clever and spend a lot of money, which probably nobody here does, but it's worth knowing about, this is how the big boys do it. This is how Netflix does it. And imagine what they're throwing around. They're throwing around giant video files. They've used something called a content delivery network, or CDN. What a content delivery network is, is it's basically a series of computers in multiple geographic locations, all of which feed from some mothership in a single location, radiating out like a flower with all petals, right? So they see the center, and all of the petals get full copies of all of this stuff, except there's one for the East <coughs> Bay, and there's one for downtown, and there's one for Nevada, East and West, and you know, there's many, many, many of these things. Now, why do they do this? Because the physical number of connections that a file has to traverse to come to you adds latency, right? So if we have to retrieve something from New England, that's going to take longer, even though it's just milliseconds in many cases, than if we have to retrieve it from San Jose. And if we can get it from next door, that's even better, right? So the way the big boys will do it is they use a CDN, and the software they have is intelligent enough to know where the nearest CDN is to the person trying to get the media file. And they're downloading through the least number of network hops that they can possibly do. And that's how network Netflix works or something like that. But think also about something like uh, even Twitter or like Twitpix or something like that. Um, all of these images flying around on Facebook or something like that, they're all using CDNs to store the content so that you can get it faster and the whole site will feel more responsive. All right, uh, so we said we'd talk a little bit about um, the actual structure of the page, the internal SEO aspects of what do you do, where do you put the keyword, under what circumstances, things like that. So this is not the slide I want. Ah. All right, this starts to be it. Um, Okay, this is an important slide. Um, all right, so I read an article the other day as I was preparing for this, and the article was basically talking about over 200 separate factors that Google's going to look at to make its judgments about how <coughs> a particular page should weigh in comparison with other pages. And they're not all really important. Some are much more important than others. But just to give you some sense for just how complex this whole sort of system of ranking and weighing is and where the sort of important leverage points are for you to take advantage of, of uh, what we're doing. The first thing for you to think about is you need to design your content around a keyword. Okay? So for most of you, the way I would recommend it is I would think about what are your specialties? What are the things that you're trying to uniquely recruit clients for, right? So maybe somebody does eating disorders, or maybe even more specifically, bulimia or binge eating, or something like that. Um, I do a lot of anger management, so that's a big keyword for me. Now, um, I'll digress in a moment to talk about how you can sort of generate keywords. There are lots of tools out there to help you with. The best one, not the best one, but the most easily <coughs> accessible one, which is free, is one that Google offers. So I'll show you what that looks like. But basically, as you design content, you want to think about the content as something focused around a particular keyword phrase that you think is relevant. And that keyword phrase may convey location information, like we said, Oakland, San Francisco, East Bay, Bay Area, something like that. And it's very likely to also want to 
you know, talk about something that is a service that you're providing and you're uniquely trying to get people to find you under this heading. Where do the keywords come from? Remember, the keywords are happening spontaneously and organically through natural language as people type in, right? Are we trained that way? No. We're trained with a bunch of jargon and technical terms and stuff, you know. We'll talk about major depression. Most people will just talk about feeling like shit, right? So major depression might not actually be the keyword you want. Now around here it probably is because people are real educated. But um, you need to think about this not through your own lens, but through the lens of the <coughs> person who is doing the searching who could become your client. What would they type? A good question to ask them when they come to see you is, if you found me online, what did you search for? Right? What? So when you're doing the keywords, it's important to repeat them over and over? Is that is that correct? Yes, within limits and in certain places. So <laughs> if, 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 if major depression was what you wanted, if as a keyword, would yeah. it be more beneficial to use lots of different words? Like depression, sadness, lonely, or is it better to just repeat the same thing? It's, it's probably better to repeat the same thing with minor variations, but there's this, uh, there's this idea called keyword stuffing, right? <laughs> Which is a fraudulent technique where people will try to create pages when, you know, it's just like keyword, 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 keyword. Right? Um, so it used to be the case that you could gain Google by shoving a bunch of keywords and random text drawn from somewhere. And basically Google was not sophisticated at that time enough to figure out what's an actually good page from some garbage that's selling Viagra, carrying a Viagra URL payload. Um, they've gotten much, much better at that. And again, remember, they're looking not just at the content of the page, but also how other pages are linking into that page, right? So you could have a great page. In the old days, you could have a great page that nobody linked to and you'd be invisible. Or you could have an absolutely garbage page loaded up with keywords and a bunch of gawk. And, but somehow there was this other fraudulent technique that was being used to create millions of links into that page and suddenly it would be popping way up high in the SERPs. Right? So that's how they used to sell Viagra. <laughs> they can't do that so well anymore because Google's managed to close most of those loopholes. But there are sites out there like, uh, one is called Fiverr. You go to Fiverr.com, you can buy like, you know, a thousand Facebook likes, five bucks. You know, there are people in India or wherever who basically sit and click all day creating fraudulent stuff just to game this, because that's very cheap labor. And those are some of the black hat <coughs> techniques that probably don't work as well anymore. Right? So this is one of the reasons why you need to be careful if you hire someone to do SEO, because what you don't want is somebody who you hired going out to Fiverr, buying a bunch of link farm links, and then basically Google comes along and says, like, well, we know that's garbage, right? So now you paid money to get somebody to hurt your website. Yes. What is H2? H2? Okay, uh, very good question. All right, so let's just go through some of these things. I'll read this and then I'll show you what it means because this is not going to mean anything the first time I show it to you. Keyword at the beginning of the title tag, the content length being longer, right? How fast the page loads, we talked about that. The page authority and the domain authority. That has a lot to do with what we talked about being the external SEO, how well you've managed to network with other people to get them to link in to your page. And also, if you own your own domain, um, little things like how long that domain has been owned, right? And have you renewed it for one year or have you renewed it for 10 years? Hmm. Renewing it for 10 years is a signal to Google, a very small one, but a positive one nevertheless, that you plan to be sticking around. So it to bump up in your favor. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's not going to make or break the page, but it's in the positive direction. Um, 
link relevancy. This has exactly to do with the inbound links from other websites. And what if all those inbound links are from uh, garbagey websites or plumbing websites? Let's say they're very high quality plumbing websites, right? And they're all pointing to your therapist website. Google knows. Google's not going to put as even though there's a lot of inbound <coughs> links, Google knows that there's something fishy about that because those links don't belong together in a naturally occurring system. Google's that sophisticated. So they won't give that the weight that they might otherwise if a lot of other therapist websites were all pointing to you. So that's link relevancy. Right? Dwell time is once you get someone to read something on your page, how long do they stay there? There's a corresponding statistic called bounce rate. Right? Which is like, not only does Google know, particularly if you give them license to know by installing something called analytics, which I recommend because they like analytics, because it's their thing. <laughs> um, but they know exactly like the average person will spend 26 seconds reading this article. And, you know, for your particular website, uh, the average person will bounce off at a rate of 87.5% and another 10% of people will hang around for 30 seconds and another 5% will hang around for 10 minutes or something like that. They know that, or they can know that. Um, and they use those sorts of things as signals. So again, if you've created something compelling where someone's actually going to take the time to read it, they know, right? And they'll give you a bonus for that. Responsive design, we already talked about that. Um, and then we, we also kind of touched on this as well when we talked about uh, the sort of doctor rating websites, right? This is a great example of thin content or algorithmically created pages. It's not actually real material, right? It's not where someone sat down and wrote an essay or a blog or something intelligible. It's, it's just sort of a bunch of database list stuff being popped out through a template. They can tell the difference based on some kind of semantic analysis and the linking patterns and stuff like that. So these are supposedly the things where if you pay attention to this, you'll get the, the best positive boost. Now, what are, what are things like H2 and title? What does that actually mean? Let's take a look at this page. Um, all right, so, so here's a web page, right? This is what it looks like to a human being. <coughs> Let's look at what it looks like to a machine. This, this is what a web page really looks like. This is an unrendered web page with all of its warts exposed and all of its sort of codes. Uh, the first thing you'll notice is something called a doc type. <coughs> that, that is communicating some information about to the, to the browser about sort of the era in which this web page was built and based on that, what it should use to sort of do its rendering. Um, this is what the latest one looks like. It's called HTML5. It starts out by saying HTML, and what you'll see is that things have an opening and a closing. This is what the opening looks like. The closing looks like the same thing with a little slash at the end prior to the uh, closing bracket. So basically, we're starting out, it says HTML, that's the protocol, right? 
That's sort of the whole system that makes this thing work. And the protocol has a section called the head. Head is completely invisible to the naked eye. It's all for the purpose of the machines to make sense out of. Um, now, in here you'll see that one of the first tags that I've got here is title. This is the title of the web page. This is the stuff that would be at the very top of the browser, along the very top edge. It'll say what the title of the page is, right? So that's how you indicate this. Now, you're probably not making your pages from scratch, so you're not going to see this directly. But in all of your content management systems, there will be something that says title. And that's what this is going to populate when it makes a page. Now, the next thing that you might see here is here. It says meta, and then it has a parameter. Name is equal to description. This is important. This is your opportunity to tell Google what the description of your page should be when it makes a row in the SERPs. Generally, Google will pick up whatever you've written here and use that as the description. If you don't supply this, then it will just pick some random text from within the page and fill it in for you. But here is an opportunity for you not only to put your keywords in, but also to um, basically have a little control over what your search result will look like. The next thing here, it says link rel equals canonical. This is an instruction to Google that if you find multiple versions of this page, all of them really should ultimately render to this particular address. This is relatively new, and it was a way that Google came up with to allow there to be various variations on the same page without incurring the penalty for duplicate content. If you use rel equals canonical, you signal to Google that all of the juice, all of the weight that it's going to assign, should be assigned to this unique URL, and any variations thereof should be starved of that juice. Um, so what else did we talk about? Was that Mark, the one higher? Was that Meta? You said. Yeah, Meta. meta. Mark? Yes. On a very kind of practical level, because you're not writing the code. We no, are, we are writing in, the page. But in your in your content management system, there's going to be a block where it says description. Ah, okay, and you should put it in. Right. Now, I mean, I don't know what all content management systems are being used, but um, basically all of these fields here are going to have corollaries in your content management systems, and part of the task is to figure out <coughs> what goes where, but I just want to give you some sense for where it ends up and how it's consumed. This stuff is all consumed by machines. This stuff here, it says script, language equals JavaScript. And then it closes, see, slash script. This is a block, and all this stuff in here is JavaScript. That's a little bit of code that executes in the browser. Yeah. Um, are you saying that there's a penalty for repeating pages on your website? If the pages have exactly the same content and they have different URLs, there will be a penalty. What do you mean by different URLs? Different ways to get in there? Like, like if, if you have if it on one, your navigation and one, you have it on a... If one says like sitetools.com page one, and then you have content, and then you have sitetools.com page two, and you have exactly the same content, and you don't do something like this, where you're telling it all of them should go to page one, page one is the real one, right? Then you're likely to, to get hit. With a duplication penalty. Okay, are the title tag and the meta should be a, just a list of the keywords that you want to. Not no no no. Yeah. You don't want to think about it like that. But like, where are you putting your keywords? Right. You want to put your keyword probably into the title. You probably want to stick it in the description. But you don't just want your description to be all about a repetition of keywords. I see. You want to be natural sounding. You just want to kind of slip the and keyword. And where does the does the end user ever see your meta description? No. Okay. Uh, they the could, meta description they, they, they see it on the search page. 
But any, oh, they did. anyone can pull up your source code. Anybody can just pull up the source code. Just the way that you did on any uh, web when page. They pull up on, on really your, you know, your blue search code, and that's what the actual user reads is yeah. your description. Okay. Exactly. So, um, just in the interest of time, since we're running out, um, see here it says, can you help me with my problem? So you see this here? Can you help me with my problem? Mm -hmm. You saw on the actual web page it was a bolded title. What was the instruction that I gave to the browser to tell it to be a bolded title? It is exactly this. It's little H3. H is for heading, and 3 means it's the <coughs> third most prominent heading. H1 would be the biggest heading on the page, H2 would be the major heads, and H3 would be the sub heads under that. It goes all the way down, like, to five or six. But basically, in the heading, you have the opportunity to stick a keyword. Again, you don't want to be obvious about this, right? Like, it has to be natural. Because you're not only writing for machines, you're also writing for people. And if people see, like, oh, look at that. If it's obvious, they'll be like, oh, this person's trying to gain. You know, that'll be a, a social signal that, you know, something isn't quite right. But basically these are sort of places within the text where you have the opportunity to place your keywords. So would, why is your bolded um, text title or whatever it's called, can you help me with my problem? Is problem like a keyword for you? No. This page really I'm not focused on trying to attract anybody in particular. This page is more of that secondary purely marketing copy, right? This is where I'm basically getting to the point really fast. Why are you here? Because I'm messed up, man. I need help. Right? Can you help me? Yes, I can help you. Where and I can it? help you with this. And these are the problems where? that I deal with. But you don't have this phrase in Kwanzaa page, or do you? Can you help me with my problem? I'm not sure I understand. So you said it was a blue button? Oh, this. Here. Call to action on the form. Can you help me with this, with my problem? That was in questions. It was a different page. It was a different, uh, it was oh, in yeah, questions. Different page. This is the home page. That was yeah. a different page yeah. called questions. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. Uh, so, in other words, on this page, what I'm really trying to do is I'm trying to really focus in on that, that very primary marketing task. How can I convince somebody who comes to this page to quickly make the decision to contact me without thinking too hard. I make a very strong appeal. Yeah, life is hard, and I can help you. And specifically, I can help you with these things. And probably, if you don't have one of these things, still contact me, because I'll send you to somebody else. You know? I'm not, I can't do everything, but I do these things pretty well. Right? And how do you do it? Well, you can contact me right here, or you can call me, or you can email me. Right? And this is on every single page. Um, so this is this is sort of if you think through what I've been tell telling you about the secondary task of trying to convince people. This is my best effort to date in terms of how I can structure a web page to appeal to that purpose and uh, you know and, and not be slimy. Because <laughs> you can see how this could become slimy, and none of us want to go there. Um, we don't have a whole lot of time here. So. Let me very quickly show you the keyword planner. Ah! So Google 
has an ad program called AdWords. They also have a program for owners of very prominent sites called AdSense, where you contract with Google to allow ads onto your site. You want ad words, where you would buy an ad to go onto either Google itself or their network. Within AdWords, this is my AdWords account, there are tools, and one of the tools is the Keyword Planner. So, um, what's a tools? Yeah, what's a what's a sort of topic that somebody might be interested in generating keywords about? Dialectical behavior theory. Okay. How do you spell it? D i a l e c t i. And Mark, you said go to tools, and from tools, Google. Um, so it's planner. AdWords.google.com will get you there. And then you want the Tools menu, Keyword Planner. You might have to sign up for a Google account or something, and they'll probably start to hit you up to spend money with them. <laughs> it's worth it. I mean, you don't have to, there's no obligation for this. So, so if you just look at sort of how this is set up, um, so we want to search for new keywords and ideas. So we're going to search around dialectical behavior therapy. We could tell it, like, specifically, I want to focus people to land on a particular page. That's a whole separate topic, landing pages. Oh, my God. I could talk for an hour about that. Um, but let's just say right now we're interested. Now, look at the targeting stuff. See, I've got it set pretty tightly for San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose, California. Basically... East, you know, Bay Area, right? These, these statistics that it's going to give back to us, which are a little bit fast and loose, but they're about as good as you can get for free, are going to reflect activity solely within this geographic area, right? So if you were doing this on a much bigger scale for some reason, you might get back much larger volumes. But what we're going to see is that the search volumes are, are probably fairly small. So let's get some ideas. Okay, so the first thing it does is it sort of returns groupings. I don't find that quite as useful. Here's another thing to, to look at here is it's giving us kind of a month-by-month -month volume graph for the general topic. And generally, uh, what you're going to find is this sort of tracks the school year. Uh, you see increasing volumes through each semester with usually a pause around December and a low spot in the summer. It's a pretty typical pattern for web properties. Uh, but that's what some of this variation is. So I'm specifically going to go over to this other tab here called Keyword Ideas. And it's giving us some information on what are topics that it thinks are semantically relevant and related, what is the approximate volume within the geographic search area, and what will they charge you um, on a per-click basis in order to be there. So, um, they also give you this information, low, medium, or high, which is supposed to reflect the amount of competition. Uh, generally, the way Google works for these ads is they pit everybody against each other in an instant auction. And they sort of put you in the position of saying, how, what's the most money you'll spend for any given click? You know, what's the most money you'll spend? They get that from everybody. Then when someone comes up having typed in a relevant keyword somewhere within the catchment, the Google servers go into their database of all of this information and they pick out the people that have said they would spend the most money. <laughs> and they basically say, okay, uh, you two guys said you would spend the most money, but he said he would spend a penny more, so he'll be higher, and then he'll be right there. And then, so that's how the rankings of these ads supposedly get put in place, with the people who spend the most money getting the highest position. This is happening every single page. A new auction, every single page. Yeah. 
Okay, not quite clear how to read this. For example, it says cognitive behavioral therapy six thousand, yeah, so and then below it says cognitive behavioral therapy four fifty. Yeah. Whoa. So so look at this. Um, dialectical behavior therapy is not unsearched, right? But I think this is a month span. What it's saying is really not that many people type it in. It's, it's searched, but the volume is pretty low. Like, within this geographic area, very few people are searching for it. It's probably too technical of a term, or too new of a term. In my estimation, cognitive therapy, old school cognitive therapy, is just dawning on the general populace. <laughs> right? Like, we're all kind of, oh yeah, that. Um, but like, in terms of if you look here at the statistics, cognitive behavior therapy, lots of people are searching for cognitive behavior therapy. Yeah, yet it still room. says low. That says low and not... It says low because in, in, in this particular... What, this is referring to the amount of competition to place highly in the ad. This is the not... This is, is low? This is the volume of searches, mm -hmm. and this is the number of other people competing to show up for the ad. So that would be a good one to choose because the competition is low and you fall through search. Potentially. Okay. Why does it what they're saying is, is they're, <laughs> what they're saying is they're looking for three dollars and forty cents every time some fool clicks on that link. That is not meaning that they're going to do anything more than just glance at your website. That doesn't mean that this is a conversion where they've actually contacted you. So it's why does it say cognitive behavior therapy below it with different number? So it repeats that. One is positive behavior and one is behavioral. Oh, I see. Yeah. 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 So why is it that the behavioral CBT therapy is, is a thousand and cognitive behavioral is, is more? Because Just because you have to put the word catch phrase that people know. That's what's in the newspapers. Remember, and remember it's not the real technical term. It's what people think the term is. Yeah, and this is, right. this but is the word behavioral therapy <laughs> is in searching cognitive behavioral therapy. Yeah, and it this might it might show up, but at least the way they've got it, I don't know how they've generated this, but this is this is sort of supposedly a reflection. So of in the Midwest, if people look for marital therapists and Bay Area, they look for couples counseling. If I uh, delineate this local area, then I'll get the keywords that are most relevant in my catchment area. Okay. Right. Yeah. So the way to think about this as you're generating what the keywords ought to be, I mean, first of all, if people are coming to you, ask them, you know, ask them, mm -hmm. right? Because that's your best source. But if you're going to do it this route, basically set for the uh, general geographic area where you are put in something that's going to get you in the ballpark and then look to see what it generates. What you're looking for is something with a reasonably high volume of searches and um, hopefully something that's not too expensive that you don't need to buy the ad. This might just be the way that you start to think about what are the, what are, what are the terms around which I'm going to build pages on my website. Right? And the difference between behavior and behavioral could be significant. So, you know, that's this. Now, um, we really need to get out of here soon. Mark, you also mentioned that it will show us how to link uh, your website to Google Plus. Yeah, right here. So basically, um, go here. <laughs> First create a Google Plus page. Um, the most important thing is you want to have a Google Plus page, and I think most of you are going to want to keep your personal page separate than your business page, but you may not all feel that way. Um, whatever page you choose, that page is going to have a unique URL. Um, let, me, let me show you. For instance, if you go to the footer here of my website, 
you'll see I've got a link here that says Google Plus, right? If we go there, that takes to, to my Google Plus web page. Uh, this is actually my personal one. And I think it knows that it's actually me, so it may be part of it. But watch what Let's happens. So. <laughs> yeah, watch what happens when I actually search for myself in Google. Right away, it knows who I am. Wow. How is that? Is it from Google Plus account? This is because I linked my Google Plus account. Do you want your home address up there? It it knows actually that it's me oh. in this instance. Oh. Yeah, that freaked me out this morning. <laughs> um, I so think if you were to do the search, you might not see it. At least I hope that's the case. And otherwise, I'm just screwed. So how do you separate your business? Yeah, with great difficulty. That's why I'm recommending, like, you know, create a separate page. Yeah, how do you do Or, or just a business us, page. You, yeah. Can you show us how? How you, where you go, because you mentioned that, can you, uh, plus, how to go? Yeah, plus.google.com will get you to Google+. Plus. No, but how do you right, but how do you separate? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you can create a separate Gmail that you use pers uh, personally versus one that you use professionally, right. and then you can create your Google Plus account with your professional Gmail. That, so that's two probably emails. a very, that might be a better so way to do it. my personal Did you say that again? So I have a personal Gmail account and I have a professional Gmail account. Mm -hmm. um, without getting too complicated about it, you can link your Google Plus to your professional Gmail account. So mine's doctor and then my last name. And when people email me, it, it also links up to my website. So it looks like they're emailing me from my website, but that's another thing. But when, either way, When, when you go to the profile it. page, whatever it is, you'll see here there's a little menu. It says profile. If you hover over it, it becomes this. Go down to this part where it says pages, right? And then this is the professional page. All right, I don't need to see that. All right. Anyway, so this is the professional. This is the professional page, or at least. Yeah, I may have the wrong page link. And where you, it's you can see how complicated this gets. Yeah. <laughs> where is it linked to your website? Um, <clears throat> that is a great question. Right here. And if we go into the editing, you have the opportunity to tell it, you know, what is my information here? Where am I specifically? Here's my office. They know exactly where I am geographically. Mm -hmm. How do you contact me? What are your hours? Some photos, a little bit of information. And then that will show up when you, when you personally are searched? Yes. Not personally, when you professionally are searched. Yeah, so, so what, what has been happening and this is, I guess, the last thing that I'll talk about here. There's been a push more and more. Um, here you can see it. These were what I was talking about in the beginning, where you've got mm -hmm. personalized or rich search results. I'm sure you've seen these. Mm -hmm. These are called rich snippets. And basically, there has been a push to do this more and more, and what it is for you is an opportunity to, to send information to Google and uh, whoever else might be consuming it, which might give you a slight advantage, at least until the arms race compels everybody else to catch up. So, um, how do you actually convey this information? Well, uh, through something called structured data. Now, one way to convey the information is like, like I was saying, link to your Google Plus page. Right? That's one way to do it. The other way is something called microdata. Um, and this gets pretty technical, but 
something like WordPress will have plugins which can be used to insert this information. So you sort of fill out the form within the plugin and it would pop these things into your web page and sort of do it for you. The website that you want to look at is called schema.org, except you don't really want to look at that. But let me show you what something might look like. So for instance, if we go back to site tools, right here at the bottom you see my address, right? My business address. Yes? Okay. If you were to take a close look at the actual code there, I've actually dressed it up with something from schema.org, which is sending a semantic signal, a machine-readable version of my address, to Google. So this is another way that I'm telling Google where I am. Okay? And this is the way that it works. There's actually something called schema.org. In this sense, schema is not like, you know, a cognitive schema, but, but an actual information schema. And it's a, a kind of a taxonomy. So they have schemas for corporations, for individual people, for movie reviews, for, you know, all different sorts of things that you might want to convey semantic information. Um, in this instance, I'm using one for a corporation. And basically, I'm saying that the name of the corporation is Psych Tools, and this is the address, the street address, the location, the region. So even though I'm conveying this visually to a human being, I'm also conveying it semantically to a robot. By going to schema.com. No. Schema.com, <laughs> schema.org, is just going to, it's just if you want to see, like, where the nerds are going who figure this stuff out. How do you do that? So, were you, exactly you embedded in your source code? Yeah. You paid someone. I mean, exactly. so I know about this, and, I can, and I'm, I've also, like, I'm doing a little bit Mark. lower level kind of web development more so than you might. But for, like, if you're using WordPress or something like that, like a pretty reasonably well used contemporary content management system, there will probably be a plugin that you could install which would do this on your behalf, and you would fill in some form. And it would just sort of pop this stuff in. Right? Does it make sense? Mark, can we see again the slide with, which says authorship? Yeah. Okay. Basically, what they're recommending is you create a Google Plus page which represents your professional identity and you put your name on it, right? And you link your pages to that profile and they're also recommending that you give your your name, your attribution, you know, it, it says like what's the title of this article and who is it by? It's by Mark Dominic. That's supposed to be enough of a signal to Google so that they will then grab your picture from your Google Plus page and shove it into the SERP. So that you know, it'll give you an authorship rich snippet in the in the SERP. And it's okay to repeat blogs or content throughout these things. You don't want to repeat content. So if I write a blog on my actual website, I have to write a completely different blog every time for Google and no. a different blog for like Facebook and Twitter and whatever people do. I don't know. Uh, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, you pretty Are people much people just do. living their life on Twitter. You, you, fortunately, Twitter is very small. But yeah, I mean, to, to really do this right, you want to become a prolific author and produce something unique for every time you, you hit the publish button. In these different places. Yeah. So. Uh, this might be a good place to sort of start to wrap up. I'm sorry I didn't get to cover everything. This is a gigantic topic. What is that thing in the middle, the A H wrap? This is this is what a link actually looks like in HTML. The what? I'll second. This is what a link looks like. A A is the is the tag for link. H wrap is the is the URL. So it's saying. See, here's that HTTPS. This is a secure URL. And here it is, plus.google.com, and that's my big old number. 
uh, and this is telling it, that's another parameter, that's telling it that this is, I'm the author, right? So on this particular page, I'm explicitly telling Google, I am the author of this page, and here is my Google Plus profile where you find all my information. So you want the link to go in both directions, from Google Plus to your website, and website to your Google Okay, and you had a little icon or something that said Google Plus. How would most of us insert on our website the Google Plus link? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> but you, you should have something there's that goes in that direction. There's no, there's no standard way to do it. They just okay. want a link back. Okay, but you don't write to the end user, here's my Google Plus link. That's you, kind of you, hidden. You could. Or you, you could. could. I mean, this is a visible link. They want a visible link. Okay. I mean, part of what they're doing is they're sort of saying, well, we want a whole bunch of inbound stuff going to Google Plus because we want this to be bigger and bigger. They've got their own purposes. Mark, you're great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can listen to you all night. Yeah. 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 I, 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 I broke the ice. <laughs> yeah. So um, let, me, let me just put an idea in your head before you go. I've been thinking about this for a while, and I think this would be a really useful thing for us as a local group of professionals to think about doing. As an individual therapist, my ability to break into the SERPs is very limited, right? Um, and that's largely a function of who's linking to me, right? And you all have the same problem, right? So, one way that a professional group can help the other members of the professional group is to create a system of interlinking. So that's one way that we might help each other in some systematic fashion to begin to interlink on a fairly wide scale. And there's another place where we could do this as well, which would be to, through one of the professional associations or, or potentially to create a separate professional association centered around this activity, to basically come up with something which, over time, could be a place where we are depositing content as, as members of this thing to create an authoritative website which would begin to, over time, I'm talking a multi-year project, to, to potentially become a center of gravity and have more and more weight. If we could do that collectively, and it would have to be collectively because none of us can produce the volume of content on our own, Mm -hmm. to, to move that mountain, but if we were all picking up a shovel and scooping and scooping, throwing more dirt on this pile, it would get big faster, and we could also point traffic towards it. If we could do something that we collectively own in that fashion, that thing then, pointing back at us, wow. would that magnify the impact of all huge. of our individuals. That's, that's, a that's, a that's a very good idea. That's a very good idea. Because I was just, I'm feeling overwhelmed, to be honest, and I'm just thinking, like, like what is the merit of for an individual person like myself to go through all this trouble? I might have created a website. Is the phone going to ring? <laughs> Are people choosing therapists based on something they see online? I, I just, I don't know. Is there is a, a, a light switch? Do you think they do? I mean, I just... Oh, yes. It's on the other side. Thank you so much. Yes,